How are you, sir? Yeah, I'm good. I'm, uh, you know, as well as can be expected under the circumstances, I think. <laughs> I'm still here. Yes, strange times, but uh, you're no stranger to them. No, um, you know, it's uh, get to get, I'm 63 now, so there's, um, I've managed to pack an awful lot into that 63 years. Um, you know, it depends where you want to go with it, really. Well, you certainly, um, a lot of wisdom, I would say, comes from your, did you say 63? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 63, was, yeah. I was reading some of your, um, uh, what is it, of the paratrooper books? What? Sorry, the wise old paratrooper books yes you know. yes yeah i did a little trilogy i when i when i um i i, I broke my neck so um i couldn't i couldn't carry on teaching karate so i went off to surrey university while my neck healed um as an undergrad at the age of 56 and uh, graduated when i was 59 in english literature with creative writing and so um i could have stayed on but uh, I, I wanted to write, so um, the first, I mean, I'd written, I'd written Fighting Scared, my autobiography before that, uh, which took me six years. But with a few of the skills and things I'd learned, I, um, I went out and knocked out three books. Um, the, the Words of the Wise Old Paratrooper, More Words of the Wise Old Paratrooper, and The Last Words of the Wise Old Paratrooper, but that's a lie. <laughs> and um, now I'm working on a poetry book, because I, 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 I've discovered a... Um, a love of poetry as well so i've got a poetry book coming out called the soldier's songs uh, in a few months time i'm working on the illustrations now you've got to write bad books before you can write good ones i think i think i struck lucky in the first one <laughs> it's a it's certainly a process isn't it yeah yeah it's hard work and i'm working on a novel but um, that's um that's a real challenge because you've got to build characters whereas most of my work to now has either been about me which is I know the story, I know the character, or um, about people that I know and short stories about people that I know. So when you have to invent people and develop them and build them into a story and remember where you left them <laughs> and have three, three stories running, you know, at the same time parallel, it's a, it's a real challenge. So I'm working hard on that. That'll, 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 that'll be a bigger, if I can manage to do that and get someone to buy it, that would be a big step up, yeah. I'll say here and now, I, I know you will manage to do it and it's going to be excellent, so good effort. I don't die first. <laughs> well, it's coming to all of us, mate. So. Yep. Yeah, we're all born <laughs> terminal, that's for sure. Do you, um, do you have any feelings about death? I'm, I'm, I've sort of made my peace with this beautiful universe and I'm, I'm here for my son, my son, really. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't frighten me. Um, I've had a, a few close calls recently. I, I, um, I had cancer two years ago and uh, it took a year to get rid of it and um, had my bladder removed. And, um, you know, that's, uh, that was a difficult time. And I was quite um, surprised to discover that when I was going in for the, for the major operation, which it is a big operation having your bladder taken out, bladder, prostate, and all your lymph nodes, um, that I was really chilled. I was really relaxed about it. I was accepting my only concern. I think when you get to a certain point in life, your concerns aren't about yourself. They're about how people are going to fill the gap that you leave. So can my wife take the bins out? <laughs> you see what I mean? <laughs> Who, does, she know how to, does she know how to pay the bills online? Um, <laughs> things like that. So you, you, you tend to worry about other people and make sure everything's okay rather than being absolute, actually frightened of dying. Um, which I don't think I, I don't think I've had been for a very, very long time. Um, when I was young, I was frightened of getting hurt. I was frightened of getting beaten up. I was frightened of all sorts of things, but, um, you over, you learn to overcome those fears with experience and, uh, and accept the consequences of your actions too. And, um, if you, if you choose to get into a difficult situation or you choose to stand up and fight for people, then you've got to accept the blows that you get as a response. If you choose to be a soldier, then you're choosing technically to go to war. So, you know, it's, it's something you've already decided. Yeah, there have been a couple of times when, I mean, we had, a, we had a crazy suicide mission into Argentina in 1982 in the Falklands War that was a one-way trip. Uh, there was no return. Uh, fortunately, at the last minute, the mission was cancelled. Uh, you're looking at the sky 
thinking, I wonder if I'll see this ever again. Um, you know, so, and a lot of soldiers, you know, going into battle have experienced exactly those things. I guess a lot of the, you know, commando types that went into the north of Norway in the Second World War had to face the fact that probably weren't, or, or maybe they didn't, but prob a lot of them didn't come back, did they? Yeah, I think, um, I think, you know, you always assume as a young person that it's going to happen to everybody else. It's a bit like COVID today. You know, I'm okay, I'm going to be all right. You know, somebody else will die. Somebody else will catch it. Somebody else will take it home. It'll be somebody else's fault. And when you're young, you're immortal. You know, you always think it'll happen to somebody else. And uh, that's not a bad thing you know, in, 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 in many ways, because otherwise, as young people, you wouldn't do anything adventurous or exciting or, you know, that makes your life worth talking about when you're 63. Um, but yeah, there's, uh, I mean, the guys that, the airborne guys that, you know, dropped behind enemy lines and uh, hoped, like at Arnhem, and then hoped that the armed forces would catch up with them. Um, otherwise, they're surrounded. There's a wonderful piece in um, uh, Band of Brothers where the Americans are going up to Bastogne um, during the Battle of the Bulge in the Second World War and a, an infantryman retreating says to his paratrooper, you know, don't go up there, you'll be surrounded. And he says, we're paratroopers, we're supposed to be surrounded. <laughs> so, you know, and I, I, could just, I could just hear somebody saying that, you know, it, it's, not, it's not bravado for the sake of the program. I reckon somebody really said that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, life, life's, life's there for the living. It's exciting. It's, it's not there for the hiding. If you hide and you get to 63, you're going to sit back and go, oh, my God, what have I done in my life? Well, I bet you must have something wise to say to our young, young people. <coughs> um, yeah. With I respect to the, the, these guys, Robin, that are sat at home playing these video games and, and suddenly maybe 10 or 20 years of their life has gone. And Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, I think, I mean, I, I mean being a, a young boy, I used to play for hours with my toy soldiers on the bedroom floor with little cannons of five matchsticks, you know, and, um, and, and go to my friend's house and play Risk and uh, Ludo and, and things like that, Snakes and Ladders. So it's the games have changed and the time spent on them hasn't really changed. Um, but in terms of um, making your life more real than just virtual and just your imagination i would say um volunteer for everything if you've got an opportunity to go on a course even though all your mates think oh that's a bit square you don't want to do that um go on it go on it because every time you go and volunteer for something you learn something and every time you learn something you have more power and you have more flexibility in your life so if you lose your job you've got another skill and other people know about you and you meet other people and you link to other people. You can link to people online all your life and call them your friends. But when you, you share a room with somebody or climb a mountain with somebody or canoe down a river with somebody, you know, and you're, you're genuinely um, at risk and you're relying on that other person, you build friendships that, that last a hell of a long time. So, yeah, volunteer for everything. Don't listen to the cynics. <laughs> What's your feeling then, Robin, on, or your thoughts on, uh, obviously a lot of military types write books, or f former military types, a lot of, lot of Royal Marines do, it's kind of, I don't know why we're quite good at it, but, but, but we seem to be. What's, what's your thoughts on this kind of, you know, Genre. people leaving the special forces and writing their memoirs or going into fiction, all this sort of this sort of thing. Yeah, if you go back to when, when I joined Special Forces, which was 1978, the only people who wrote books were officers. You know, um, us enlisted men were, were too stupid to um, put words together and write things down on paper. So the, um, the kind of glass ceiling was broken by uh, Andy McNabb you know, with Bravo 2-0, um, where a, go a ghostwriter came along and basically said, you know, come on, I'll write, I'll write the book, you tell me the story and we'll make some money. And um, it broke, it broke the, the glass frame. After that, you know, there were um, rules put into the Special Air Service to say, 
you know, you had to, you had to sign a prenuptial agreement, really, saying you won't write uh, books when you leave. But a lot of guys signed those and then broke it. Fortunately for me, I I left before those um, those rules and things were were made. And um, I wrote uh, Fighting Scared in. Uh, it took me six years, but I, I published it in 2002. Um, and it's not really an SAS book. It's a personal development story about a young, bullied, unpopular, um, lonely kid who doesn't know how to mix in with his peers, who um, who goes to join the army at the age of 14. The school leaving age was 15 in 1972, so um, I joined at the age of 15. And uh, I had a broken home, as I say, and um, uh, so I, I went from, I went, very much went from the frying pan into the fire, um, where, I, you know, because I was vulnerable, I, um, I became a victim of my peers in my 12-man room as well. But I liked to stand up for myself, and so I did learn to stand up for myself, and I got my self-esteem from doing my job better than other people. Not better than everybody, but better than other people, always being in the top 10%. And it didn't matter whether people called you names or picked on you or, or isolated you. The fact was, I could, the fact for me was, I could draw solace from the fact that I could run faster than them, carry more weight than them, do my job better than them. Um, so um, I survived. There's a, a famous piece in An Officer and a Gentleman where uh, the, the character that Richard Gere's playing gets beaten up by the, the black recruiting sergeant. And uh, he says, why don't you go home? And Gia says, you know, I've got nowhere to go. And I was very much that boy. Although I did have a home and a mum and a stepfather, I, um, I, um, it wasn't a place I wanted to really spend my time. But uh, 15, uh, in 1972, there were more than 13,000 boy soldiers full time in the British Army. And they, um, they, a lot of them were guys with great potential who weren't doing well at school. And the British Army offered them all sorts of opportunities, uh, apprenticeships, technical jobs, infantry jobs, leadership roles, adventure, guns, um, canoes, mountains, you know, um, and if I, 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 I'm really sad that that system has been reduced to only something like 1500 now at Harrogate, um, where you had it all over the British Isles and large numbers of guys from my era became very good citizens and uh, skilled tradesmen and the employers and the middle class of of the future as well as being the majority of the regimental sergeant majors of their regiment so mm. yeah that was um but i went on uh, 17 and a half i went on for power power edge and um by the time i got to by the time i was 17 and a half i'd already done a thousand hours of soldiering before i even got to paradepo and by the time i was 21 um, I went off to, I volunteered to go off to the SAS, um, partly because I was in a small independent unit called the Vigilant Button that was disbanding. Milan Missile had come in and was taken over from our missile, and they wouldn't let me go back to 2nd Battalion the Parachute Regiment. They were going to send me back to one para. And just to cock a snoot at authority, I went and signed up for, to go on, I volunteered to go on SAS selection. So uh, I didn't go there because, uh, because I, Everybody told me I was far too young, but um, they were wrong, which is nice. <laughs> yeah. Why do you think it is wrong? I mean, I, I, I'm, <coughs> I'm getting the feeling that we've, we've had quite similar upbringings. And it does make you feel different when, when you're in a, a, a group. I think that young, I didn't have a father. My, my father was in prison, so I never knew him as a child. And um, Jeffrey Horsfall, who gave me his name, adopted me when I was eight years old. And his way of dealing with me was to beat the hell out of me. Um, not smack me, but batter me. Um, so I was probably a very difficult kid because in that seven years, I never had a good male role model. I never had somebody to wrestle with on the floor, to joke and laugh with, to take the mickey, call me names and laugh. All those things that you learn as a young boy that put you in good stead when you're a teenage boy. Um, so you don't know how to laugh at yourself. You don't know how to be joshed. You don't know how to answer back. And when somebody batters you, they take away your ability to negotiate. 
because you don't think that anything you say is going to be listened to and it's going to make things worse. So I think the lack of good male role models is one of the big reasons that um, some teenagers feel lost and isolated uh, from their group and they're always on the outside of the, of the herd. They're never on the inside of it. And it doesn't matter how desperately hard they try, um, they're different and people know they're different and they feel different. Um, it's, uh, so you can either be the whip puppy at the back or you can, you can go ahead and lead, but you'll never be in the group. And that's, uh, that's just one of the, one of the things you, that I had to deal with. Yeah, it, it, almost exactly the same as myself, Robin. It's, I'm just thinking of our young people that are listening. A lot of people ask me about joining the, the forces and stuff. And um, a lot of them say I'm, I'm already getting bullied at school. And I'm like, it, it's not necessarily going to be easier for you in the forces. No. And if you, if you get, if you're the one that gets bullied, yeah, it can get really serious. Well, it's a, it's a funny thing, but I was already a young paratrooper. Um, I'd done, two tours of Northern Ireland and uh, I was on the British shooting team and I was still, I mean, I could be brave with a gun. I could be brave going into a crowd. I could do all sorts of brave things. When it came to that face to face confrontation, um, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. I, I still don't understand why people victimize uh, and isolate individuals, but I do know how to deal with it. And um, what changed me was very much that I was, I was in Cyprus and, uh, two guys came into the room drunk and I was the only person in bed and they decided to beat the hell out of me with broom handles. And then they attacked me with a razor and then they tried to make me wake up in the shower after having me knocked me unconscious. And um, then they threw me in a bed and threw a sheet over me. And um, the noise I was making because I couldn't breathe alerted a corporal in the middle of the night and pulled the sheet back and called an ambulance. And 10 days later, my eyes, I could open my eyes and see the damage that had been done. And I had a broken jaw, a dislocated jaw, broken fingers, broken ribs, um, multiple cuts. Um, it took me four weeks to get out of hospital. And um, after that, I went from being the sort of do your job, keep your mouth shut, be quite timid, to being the person who was going to make sure that never happened to me again. So I went from being... You know, bully Bob to bad Bob, so to speak. And um, if anybody was looking for it, I was going to give them it. And uh, it took me, it took me a while to get over that. Um, what really changed me was meeting my wife. <laughs> Strangely enough, <laughs> when I was 21, coming up 22, uh, she calmed me down, gave me back my um, humanity. But um, there's still a veneer covering that up. Uh, there's still part of me that will not allow anybody to intimidate, victimize or bully me or anybody else. I'll always step into a group and say, come on, settle down. I'm not, I'm, I'm going to stand by this man. You're victimizing him or woman. Yeah. So I'm still there. Um, I wasn't, um, it doesn't make you friends. Being, being extremely violent doesn't make you friends, but uh, it makes people leave you alone. Um, there you go. Yeah, it's funny. It, 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 it's funny what you get. I mean, I was a good Marine, you know, I was, I could do my job. I could keep, keep up on the run. I was never like a Marine Marine. I would never, you know, I always felt like I was a bit of a spectator. Yeah. But there'd always be that one person that would, they pick up on your vibe. Yeah. And they didn't like it. That's right. You know, and the trouble is then the other guys that actually did like you are all a bit scared of this guy. That's right. So they start talking down to you, which then, and it can be a, yeah, it can be either a lonely place to be or it can be a place you just got to fight. That's right. Because yeah. you, and the thing is, it's very difficult to fight because you don't feel that you're fighting the individual, you're fighting the whole group. So if you pick on one, you know somebody else is going to come in from the side or from the back. Or if you argue back, they're going to join in. With the, but I, I put um, bullying in three words. Isolate, humiliate, intimidate. 
First, they isolate you from the group because of your color, because of your red hair, because of your personality, because whatever it is, because you're sensitive about something. And um, it took me a long time not to be sensitive about personal insults. Um, but uh, once they've highlighted that, you know, other people join in, as you say, the spotlight's on you. And they'll join in to keep the spotlight on you because they don't want the bully putting the spotlight on them. So you can, you can be surrounded by really brave guys who do really brave things, but they're moral cowards. <laughs> and, yeah. um, you know, they really are. And that's not just in the military. That's in life in general. I mean, I know in politics, you know, you will, people will praise you and cheer you and put you up on a pedestal and you're saying all the things they want to say. And then as soon as you say something that they may disagree with, and they're immediately trying to shoot you down again. You know, you can say yes to people 10 times. You say no to them once, you're an asshole. <laughs> um, people are fickle and strange. Um, and I, uh, I see it. I don't necessarily understand it, but I know what they do. Yes, the, there's, that's the thing, isn't it? I, sounds really wrong, bad saying this, but most people just seems to be cowards. Yeah, they're watchers. They're watchers. Um, you've got the, you, in, in, in a group, you've got the bully and you've got the hero and then you've got the watchers. And the watchers see if the hero is going to stand up to, um, and defeat the bully. If he does, great. They'll all go across to his side. If they don't, they'll all say he's an idiot for trying. <laughs> you know, it's, it's something that people will, people will pray for you on Sunday and they'll cut your throat on Monday. And in, in the regiment, I gathered it wasn't plain sailing in this respect. Well, I think my personality, your personality goes with you. And if you think you can run away from a problem by moving to somewhere else, you're going to be seriously disappointed because you go with you. You carry your problems on your own back. Um, you can't change the world. You can only change yourself. And that's the difficult thing. Um, I got in too young. I got in just after my 22nd birthday, um, which made older men resent me for being there as a young upstart. <clears throat> and I hadn't, I wasn't mature enough to know when to keep my gob shut either. So um, I would say I, I expected standards to be somewhat higher. Um, but, um, and I voiced those concerns with a view to trying and improving it. But I was too young, I was a new boy, and I should just keep quiet. But when you had people coming into rooms to take lessons who didn't even understand, didn't understand the basic principles of taking a lesson, let alone the material they were trying to teach. Um, I'll give you one example. I had a, a sergeant, a staff sergeant, who came to the room to give a mortar fire control lesson when we're going down to the Falklands. And he left out direction and type of fire. Now, if you know anything about the trigonometry of artillery fire, Without the direction, you have no idea where the rounds are going to land. You know, it's a, it's a piece of mathematics that counts to make sure the bombs land in the right place. And when I complained about it after the lesson, I was told I had a bad attitude. <laughs> so where do you go with that? Um, the regiment are good at what they do, but they're not necessarily good at everything. They're not knights in white shiny armor. They're not all heroes. Some beat up their wives, some uh, neglect their kids, um, but you know most of them are good soldiers at the jobs they're trained to do and required to do. Um, it, they're not all they're not all as special as the mythology would like to make them. That's for sure. And is the selection? <clears throat> well, let me just ask you: What was your experience of it? Well, I did it twice. The first time I did it, I failed. <clears throat> I got into test week, which is the um, SAS selection lasts a year. And the first four weeks is in the mountains. And the last five days in the mountains is test week, where you do uh, increasing distances with increasing weights. So you start at 18 miles and you end up with the last march at 40 miles. And there's a minimum time. And you have to do these things on your own. So it's nothing like the television programs. There's nobody cajoling you or pushing you or encouraging you. 
It's basically, <clears throat> here's your next checkpoint, get there. And when you get there, you get given the next one and the next one. And everybody's doing slightly different routes. You can't follow people. Um, my test week was in the coldest winter for many years in uh, January 1979. I'd failed in the summer 1978. There were 67 of us on it. And um, uh, one person, nobody can got to the first checkpoint on uh, endurance, which is the 40 mile march, because the weather was so horrendous. And one person died. <clears throat> so they, um, they sent 22 of us off to the jungle to do jungle training. And when we got back from the jungle, they passed nine of us. And then we went on and then we did combat survival training. Um, and at the end of that, they failed one person. So there's only eight of us left. And then those guys that weren't already paras went off to do their parachute training. And then you join your squadron and you get your cap badge, but you're on probation for six months. And you have to learn a personal skill and a troop skill. And my personal skill was as a paramedic. And my troop skill was as a mountain climber. And then at the end of the year, so my my um, selection officially started on January the 7th, 1978. And on January the 7th, 1979, I was officially classed on my military records as being a qualified SAS soldier. So you get that a year afterwards. And then you stay for another two years and then you're reassessed. And if you, you then you can stay for another three years and you're reassessed. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of paranoia um, about everything. You can't afford to fail. But it's um, one of the things about the selection process, it selects people to be individuals. Whereas when you're selected to be a booty or you're selected to be a para, you're selected to work strongly as a team. And the weakest man, everyone has a bad day, you know, um, looking after the weakest man and so on, because you're a unit. Whereas uh, when you're selected to be individuals, that can be great when you're working in tiny groups or alone. But when you're working, um, when you're, uh, everybody thinks they should be in charge. <laughs> so it can cause uh, an awful lot of friction. You need to keep guys like that very, very busy and very, very focused all the time. When they've got nothing to do, they start fighting amongst themselves. Robin, what, what year was the embassy siege? The embassy was May the 5th, 1980. Oh, 40 years ago. Yep, yeah, yeah, two years before the Falklands. May the 5th, 1980. And it was the day when everybody suddenly discovered uh, that the SAS existed. A lot of people didn't know it existed before that. Even in the British Army, a lot of people didn't know it existed. It was a very small unit, 250 bad soldiers, four Sabre squadrons, supported by about another 200 men in darkest Herefordshire. And um, it was a great place to be and a great unit to be with. Um, the mission itself was, was a great mission. Um, you know, I had my part in it. but. Um, it lasted seven minutes, really. Um, whereas, you know, walking the streets of Northern Ireland uh, in the Ardoin, in the Valley Murphy, night after night, waiting for somebody to choose the ground and shoot you, was a far more frightening experience. I mean, fifth, uh, nearly 50 of us went into the Iranian embassy. And um, we rescued 19 people. We rescued, we saved 19 people's lives. We killed five terrorists, captured one, but we saved 19 people's lives, which is an important thing, which is what we were there to do. Um, but it, it, it changed because suddenly people started to believe their own press. And suddenly, you know, that uh, anonymous group that had a good budget, that could do all sorts of amazing things, was under the spotlight. And, um, you know, the regiment changed, and um, I don't think it necessarily changed for the better during my time, because at the same time, the British Army brought in this, you know, if you've done a certain amount of time, you have to be promoted. You have to carry so much rank after three years, six years, nine years. And uh, suddenly guys who weren't really qualified were suddenly given rank that, um, that they, they didn't even pass their education promotion certificates for. And uh, that created a lot of frustration. Guys that would have been happy to let brighter people, more ambitious people go past them were suddenly forced to carry rank. And it damaged the SES for quite a long time. Did you ever, Robin, when you were obviously lining up to go through, go through the, those doors and windows, 
I mean, I, I know the obviously know the answer to my own question, but did you ever imagine the legendary status that would be bestowed on not just yourselves but that mission? Yeah, it's only. I mean, afterwards, you're excited. You're. I mean, I was 23. Um, you're excited. You're anonymous. You disappear into back to Hereford. Nobody knows who you are. You're not allowed to talk about it, and you get on with your job. It's the rest of the nation that's excited about it. Um, and because we were taken back to Hereford and allowed to get on with our role and our jobs, and we were anonymous, um, we, 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 most of us didn't get uh, too full of hubris. Most of us carried on and tried to just get on with the, the, the life that we'd had before. It was, only, it was only as time passed and you got the anniversaries. I mean, me... John McAleese and Tom McDonald um, only spoke about it on camera 25 years later uh, when uh, Louise Norman did her famous BAFTA winning, winning um, documentary, SAS Embassy Siege, which was really, really good and very, very accurate. Um, but it took us 25 years to talk about it or write about it. So I think we kept our, our part of the bargain very, very well. Um, but it is a, a, a huge part of British history that anybody that was alive at that time and remembers it, the Americans had tried 10 days before to go into Tehran and rescue their own hostages uh, in the American embassy in Iran. And the mission had gone wrong. And um, through accidents and failures, and they killed eight of their own men. And it was a big disaster. So the world morally was on a big load. And this lifted not only British people, but it lifted the whole world who suddenly realized, yes, we can do something about terrorists. We can fight back against the PLO who are blowing people up. Um, it, it did put the uh, IRA on the back foot as well in a big way. Um, they became even more frightened of the SAS than they previously were, knowing that if we caught them, you know, the chances are they were going to perish. So. Yeah, it was a big, a big change. Gosh, was it ever. I'm guessing it, for the British public, the thing that was so both shocking and impressive all rolled into one was the fact that other than war films, you didn't actually see yeah. British forces or any force engage the enemy. And yet there it was in broad daylight in our capital city. Yeah. Not only that, but hang on, this army's wearing black. That, what's that about? Um. <laughs> yeah, and every, 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 every terrorist group, every counter-terrorist group since then decided to wear black. I mean, somebody decided we would be wear black army um, boiler suits, and that's what they were. They were boilers, you know, um, green boiler suits dyed black. <laughs> they weren't fireproof. Um, everybody thinks we wore balaclavas. We didn't. We wore gas masks and gas suits with gas hoods on. And so this idea of balaclavas uh, came because two guys who were on the outside periphery on the uh, cordon decided to rush up to the wall and try to get involved and they were wearing balaclavas. But um, no, we weren't wearing balaclavas. Um, so there's all, there's all kinds of mythology and nonsense that has come out afterwards. Um, you know, the, that, that terrible film that came out sometime couple of years back six days um i wrote the review about it in the daily mail i mean it was just such a such a disaster such a misrepresentation of what actually happened and the characters involved when people characterize soldiers they want to characterize them as some kind of um eastenders danny dyer odd man you know can't shut his mouth and talk to like that or you know and we, we, you know, and I know that there's so many of the British Army who are really, really smart, intelligent guys who can do so many things so well. It's just that they've got that job and that role to do. And I, I really do uh, hate it when uh, special forces, paras, marines, uh, uh, all members of the British Armed Forces are portrayed as dumb, enlisted man idiots um, because. There are, there are some of them that are, that's the truth, <laughs> but uh, the majority are really, really smart guys who 
just haven't had the advantages that other people had at the beginning of their lives. And that's a lot of the reasons why we end up um, running businesses, presenting podcasts, um, writing books, running corporations, um, traveling around the world, um, doing many, many things and getting qualified in going to university later in life. So many of my infantry junior leader battalion friends uh, ended up with master's degrees. You wouldn't believe how many. <laughs> yeah, that's, that sounds like a Donald Trump comment. You wouldn't believe how many. <laughs> but, uh, were you, Robin, were you portrayed in that film? I'm just wondering if I saw, if, if your because they only listed like two names at, at, at the end, yeah. John Mack being one of them, obviously. Yeah. I guess they came no, I, I, it's hard to say because the story's so um, irrelevant. As I say, there were there were forty eight of us that went into the building, and there were there were uh, five teams of eight, one for each floor. So, and there were two teams: the blue team and the red team, led by two captains. And the idea that a lance corporal, in any shape or form, would have an influence over how the mission was run, and uh, they portrayed the the squadron commander Hector Gullen as uh, as a person who was going to be told what to do by his sergeants. I mean. Nothing could be further than the truth. Gullen was a, a roughy, toughy uh, man who was in charge, and there was no doubt about it. And he planned and uh, coordinated the whole mission from start to finish and didn't get an award. Um, there were some brave things done on the day, but uh, the whole team did the job. Um, the, um, and, you know, it, it, just, it, just, wasn't, it just wasn't right. Um, the way the... Uh, imagery, the way the characterizations, the way the story was presented. The only true bits in it were the bits that they cut and pasted from the um, television reports. And that's that's sad. I'd hope for better. I really hope for better. Mm. There you go. Can we talk some practicalities of, of that um, that mission? Because yep. I just fascinate from a military perspective. So what? Well, first of all, where, where, what was your entry point, Robin? Were you, were you coming back down? No, the back door. Back door, ground floor. And, and, no, and nothing's changed. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was so, in the back door. Servant's entrance. <laughs> yeah. No, um, um, we, had, um, we had, as I say, we had uh, five teams, uh, roof, uh, front balcony, back balcony, um, basement and ground floor. And I was partnered off with a guy called Jin Jung. And uh, we had to, um, the guys had to go in the back door. We had to hold the back door and respond to any emergency. So go anywhere in the, on the five floors there where there was a problem. Um, one of the guys coming down the back of the building put his foot through a window and compromised the approach. So we had to go early. So instead of blowing the back doors, we, uh, Bob Curry took it out with a sledgehammer. And uh, in went the guys. The guy stuck on his rope, uh, burning on, over, the, over the first floor balcony, um, was, um, had his pressel switch pressed on his radio. So he was burning and screaming and uh, communications went down. So when he managed to get cut down, communications came back on. The commander didn't know what was going on in the building. So he sent me and Ginger in his reserves. And we got in inside just in time to see um, Trevor Locke the policeman who had been held hostage, come clear at the bottom of the stairs in the gas. So I took him out, went back inside. The hostage started coming down. Um, it was pretty much organized, but once we were in, we were staying in. And um, so we started throwing the hostages out. And then um, one of the terrorists was mixed, mixed up amongst the hostages. Um, two people, me and one other, shot him at the bottom of the stairs. Uh, I put three rounds in him. The other guy put 24 rounds in him. Um, which is questionable. Um, and uh, out went the hostages, out went the, out, and um, there were five terrorists killed, the one at the bottom of the stairs, four upstairs, 19 people rescued, seven minutes, the building's on fire. Out we go, um, put them all on the grass. Uh, Sim Harris, one of the rescued hostages, was high identifying Fauzi Najad, who was the terrorist that had got out hidden amongst hostages. He's laying on the grass and we, me and a guy called Tony, we move him across and away from the, um, from the uh, hostage group and um, handcuff them all. 
um, seven minutes from the go, 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 and it was all done. Mm. And then the fire brigade had to go in and put out the fires. But uh, yeah, um, Margaret, uh, Willie Whitelaw, the Home Secretary, wanted to take us out in front of the world's press. And uh, Hector said, no, put us in the back of a big yellow pantechnicum with all our kit. And we anonymously disappeared down a back street and we were gone to Regent's Park Barracks. And we got where our vehicles were actually parked. We had six Range Rovers and six white transits. And we drove back to Hereford that night. Um, um, you, you had a drink with Maggie, didn't you? Yeah, she came to Regent's Park Barracks with uh, Dennis to chat to us. Uh, and introduced herself to, shook hands with all of us, which was, for a, you know, a guy who was 23, it was quite exciting. Mm. And, um, you know, there were a few jokes made, and they put our assault on the television, I think it was the nine o'clock news, and she was there, and um, the famous story about how she, she was at the front, standing in the way of the telly, and uh, John McAleese said, hey, Hen, if you get your effing head out of the way, you know, I can't see the telly, <laughs> with his Glaswegian accent. Hey, Hen, can you get your iPhone head out of here? I can't see my, my son on the telly, like, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and so that, well, that went down as a, uh, as a legendary quip. <laughs> From a legendary man, by all accounts. Well, I think some people are trying to make him into a legend. Um, but, you know, John was a, a wonderful guy, a wonderful soldier. You know, um, one of my very close friends for a long time. Um, our wives grew up together. They were bridesmaids for each other. Our kids grew up together, you know. Um, but um, I don't think I, he was very much. He was extraordinarily popular, and um, but he was he was just one of the boys, just one of the group, you know. Um, and I don't think um, he would. Uh, well, I, I can I can imagine the words he would use if uh, if people tried to describe him as a legend. You know, and it, it, it wouldn't be good English, I'd say. <laughs> you know, you know, like, <laughs> you know and, um, I wrote his obituary um, in the Sun newspaper, um, and I wrote it fondly about him when he was, you know, in his early 30s, not when he was an older man. And I, I, I said he was never happier than when he had his muddy boots on your coffee table, drinking your tea. Um, or walking naked around your house with two tattoos, um, two eyes tattooed on the cheeks of his ass. <laughs> so, mm. yeah, he's a wonderful human being. Could, um, legend, that's another story. Could you say, Robin, he, he died of a broken heart? Well, yeah, I mean, the unimaginable pain of losing Paul um, a year before, um, obviously, was extraordinarily painful. And John liked to drink and he liked to smoke. And um, in many ways, you combine those three things together. And yeah, I, um, I think that uh, it certainly contributed to his um, heart attack, without a doubt. Yes. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. Robin, going back to the abseil, what, what, what actually went wrong on that did it did this was it a star sign did he get something caught in his carabiner or, or? yeah we were abseiling on figure of eights a figure eight as you know what it is but people listening might not it's uh, a thing you clip your carabiner into and your right runs through it and um you know you abseil you can control your abseil quite well with it but as he was abseiling down the back of the building and his foot went through the window his uh, glove got caught in the rope and in the figure of eight and he got stuck under pressure and he couldn't get his hand and his glove out. So he couldn't continue to descend. Mm. So when the guys that did descend threw the flashbangs in and the windows caught fire, the curtains caught fire, those flames started lapping up. The guys on the roof um, started to, the guys on the roof actually started to try to cut him down, but he's kicking himself away from the flames. So as he's pushing himself out, if they cut, they cut the rope as he pushes out, he's going to fall 30 feet onto solid concrete. So they have to get him on the inswing, which they managed to do. And then when he did finally hit the balcony, in spite of his burned legs, he went in and carried out his mission and finished it. So you know, that's, that's, that's an extraordinary thing to do under pressure. Gosh. Tommy Palmer, who was on the same balcony beneath him, 
he went in first, his head caught fire, <laughs> um, and his gas mask started to melt. So he went out, took the gas mask off, put the fire out, and then went back into the gas without a gas mask and carried on his mission. Extraordinarily brave thing to do. Well, that, that brings me on to my next question, Robin, because we've all worn a bloody respirator on the range, and it, it, I don't think our civilian uh, friends out there would even begin to understand. You cannot breathe with these things on. Let, you, you run 100 yards. <laughs> it's, yeah. It, yeah. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll, a, a sneaky little tip here is if you just undo the canister <laughs> tweaks, right? tweaks, it's not going to protect you from a deadly gas, but at least you can breathe. Yeah, but that was a real. It, that was a double thing, wasn't it? One, it's really intimidating to come face to face with somebody wearing that because you wouldn't hardly have known who the hell is this guy. Well, you know the the, the shot. Yeah, it's frightening. And then, of course, you know you didn't know what was going to go off inside the embassy from a. Well, I suppose you had the fire for the smoke for a start. Well, the um. The, the um, flashbangs you throw in, they make a lot of gas, they make a lot of smoke, they make a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. And you're used to that. They're not used to it. And uh, it sounds like gunfire. A lot of the noise wasn't actually gunfire. It was, simul it was simulated gunfire from the grenades. So it makes everybody, you know, close their eyes, put their heads down and hide. And so it gives you a huge advantage. Um, the thing about the breathing, one of the things about breathing is, you know, the extraordinarily sta extraordinarily high standards of fitness that you have to have um, and the training put you, make, make that normal for you. You know, working hard with gas masks. Um, you're wearing about 40 pounds of equipment with your weapons and your ammunition and your body armor and everything else. Um, there's, a, there's a guy called um, um, Malcolm Gladwell, who's a professor at uh, Harvard University and a journalist. And he wrote Blink and Tipping Point. And he said that um, when a man's heartbeat goes over 145 beats a minute, he can't make minor cognitive decisions. In other words, you can't, your brain can't accept the detail. It can only accept big pieces of information. So you, the fitter you are and the more used to danger you are, the lower your heartbeat stays in a crisis situation. It's why policemen make mistakes. Because A, they're not trained under dangerous circumstances. And um, B, they're not that fit. And consequently, when something unusual, scary happens, the heartbeat whacks straight up and they can't make the training that they've had, can't kick in because their brain won't allow it to. All you can see when you run down into the underground is, oh, there's a guy with a gun, I've got to kill him, he's got curly hair. That's it. Mm -hmm. um, fitness is vital and uh, training under pressure is vital and training with danger is vital if these jobs are going to be done correctly. My, my biggest question is, who forgot the fire extinguisher? <laughs> Do you know, I don't know if they were already there, but it wasn't our job to put the fire out. <laughs> Do you think that was, because someone, I was talking about this to, with someone the other day, and I said, well, in your training, you'd be in a mock-up building. It wouldn't have had curtains or fluffy couches and pillows and stuff. It, and the flashbangs would have gone off and there'd obviously be an explosion, but there wouldn't have been combust, much combustible stuff. But when you're actually on the job, was that something that nobody considered or it just was never going to be in? I mean, what I mean is, ha had the building gone up any faster than it did, then, then you'd all have been, you'd have um, had an additional problem is what I mean. Well, I think the... The, the point is that you've got a job to do, and the job is primarily to save the hostages and to do it as quickly as possible. To do it as quickly as possible, the most effective way of neutralizing a danger is to kill the terrorists. So kill the terrorists, save the hostages, get out, and get out, get out quickly. I mean, we were in and we were out in seven minutes, and that building burned for another couple of hours mm. with the fire brigade there trying to put it out. Um, you know, that wasn't one of our concerns it didn't come into the the training in any great way because the i think the assumption was you know that's somebody else's problem <laughs> we're going yeah. to do this we're going to save the hostages and if the building burns down well that's sad <laughs> we don't care yes and the your submachine gun what what 
brand was that? Because it was a, a Heckler and Koch MP5, um, which was um, amazing, a uh, very modern submachine, new submachine gun for the period, an extraordinarily effective weapon that is still used today. Nine millimeter, low velocity, thirty round magazine, um, and um, uh, very little uh, recoil, so you could fire very, very good short bursts into a target very, very easily um, with great accuracy. I mean, the, the standard was three round bursts enough to kill anybody, and it is, especially if it's in the face or in the heart. Had that um, superseded the, what was the regular nine millimeter? Oh, the SMG. Was that, was that, that wasn't Browning, was it like the pistol? That, who, who no, the, the Brownings we had on our hips were the nine millimeter Browning. Um, with an extended magazine, so I had a 20 round, mag 20 round magazine on it as a backup weapon. Um, but the, uh, the SMG was what the counter-terrorist team started with in uh, the, mi the mid 70s. But by the time we got to 1977, um, you know, the budget had come in, the um, weapons had upgraded, and uh, everything was, um, was very, very uh, um, avant garde, leading edge. Uh, for that time, as you know, and that investment proved itself on that day. Yes, <laughs> still proving itself to this day. If um, books and movies are anything to go by, yeah. What's up? What? Where were you when the Falklands kicked off? Um, I was in Hereford. Um, our job was to uh, fly down to uh, Ascension Island, get onto two C one thirty Hercules fly into Argentina, land on one runway where the Super Entente jets were flying from, the ones that had sunk our capital ships, and uh, destroy them on the ground, and then be killed or captured. So that was our mission. And um, we prepared for it. We got halfway. Um, but the, predominantly, the Marines and paratroopers were advancing across towards Stanley quite successfully. And um, the um, Ronald Reagan's government put pressure on Margaret Thatcher not to extend the war onto the mainland. Um, and so we held on Ascension Island and um, the mission was eventually canceled. Uh, my wife was eight months pregnant at the time, which was um, an interesting dynamic. Um, but um, coming towards the end, before Stanley had fallen, we um, managed to get our mission reinstated, but to fly down, parachute into the sea, and uh, carry out any mission that was required, perhaps attack Stanley from the rear. And um, we got down there, parachuted into the sea, and the RAF hadn't put the parachutes on the rigs properly, and uh, all our kit, the parachutes came off the containers, and all our kit went to the bottom of the sea. <laughs> and then, um, you know, the Argentinians heard that half a B squadron arrived with no kits, so they surrendered. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was Stanley like then, Robin? It, it was it, on the on the news footage. It just looked a mess. Yeah. Um, anybody that's been into Wales and Sunnybridge um, or Exeter and Dartmoor will uh, recognise um, the Falkland Islands. And essentially, I, I described it as sunny bridge without trees. Um, there's even less shelter, um, but it's cold, it's wet, it's miserable, it's grey, and it's bitterly, bitterly cold because of the damp. Um, so when I got into Stanley, um, I went to see some old mates at Two Para and uh, hung out with them for a little while, then went back to the ship, Lancelot, I was on Lancelot. And um, I got a message on the um, over the radio that on the 18th of um, 18th of June that my um, my first son Alex had been born four days after the surrender. So yeah, that was, um, was a surreal in a sense that it's too far away to you know re really be able to enjoy it. And I got home when he was 10 days old. So yeah. Wow. And how long? Um how long after the Falklands did, did you stay in the forces? Um, I, left the, um, I left the British Army in uh, November 1984. Um, 
I'd been set up by one or two people that didn't like me. And um, we had a new squadron commander who didn't know very much about the guys. And um, I ended up in the colonel's office and the colonel said, you haven't done anything wrong this horse, this time, horseful, but you're, uh, you've been walking on a razor blade for a long time. Um, so I'm going to punish you and send you back to the parachute regiment. So that's cool. You know, I haven't done anything wrong, but you're going to punish me. And I said, that's all right, sir. I put my papers in to buy out yesterday. He said, don't do that, horseful. He said, the wind blows cold on the outside. I said, it don't blow too effing warm in here, does it, sir? <laughs> and um, I was discharged from the army uh, from Hereford within two weeks. And my life moved on and I was 27 years old. I'd been in for 12 years. Um, it was my life. I was going to be a 22 year soldier, but um, I got stitched up. Um, and I was very, very bitter at the time, but I moved on and, um, and did lots. Of, and it allowed me to explore my true potential, shall we say. There are lots of things I could never have done had I stayed in the British Army that I did as a, as a result of that departure. So sometimes the worst things that happen in life turn out to be some of the best. Yes, exactly. You, it's impossible to, to put into words what, what you learn as a person when you're out and about in the world, traveling around, getting involved in different experiences, compared to the, the mindset you'd probably have had you stayed in for 22 years. Um, yeah, I know a lot of guys after 22 years um, are institutionalized. You've been in that secure and safe womb for all of your life where the word no doesn't really exist because, you know, somebody suggests something to you, it's an order, they're a senior rank, you get on with the job. And then all of a sudden you become a civilian and it's another man's jungle and you, it takes a while to get used to it. Well, I was 27 and it still took me two years to learn how to say no. Do I get overtime? <laughs> um, and I had lots of other adventures. I mean, I, I was the bodyguard to the Al Fayed family in London initially, but that's boring. So I went off to Sri Lanka as a mercenary and um, found I was on the wrong side. The side that I was on were committing atrocities. Came back to UK, um, got offered a job uh, in Tamil Nadu training the other side, um, but the big hand came on my shoulder from the foreign foreign office saying we don't want you to do that so I didn't um, I did some bodyguarding jobs and eventually ended up as the bodyguard to Rafiq Hariri who was lined up to become the Prime Minister of Lebanon which was a real bodyguard job with a real threat and we were traveling all over the world negotiating for the release of French hostages from Hezbollah in Lebanon um, talking to George Schultz in the um, American State Department, um, Reagan, I think, was, was uh, president at the time. And it was a, a wonderful, exciting job uh, with loads of money. But um, my wife got ill in pregnancy again, so I packed that one in and um, took a job in England working for um, an evil American called Al Dunlap, who, was, uh, who brought down Chrysler, who was voted the world's worst boss in the USA, um, and he was. Um, after four weeks, I wanted to kill him myself. <laughs> uh, and you know, and then um, you know, I went back. I uh, couldn't. I wanted to get a job as a paramedic on an oil rig, but um, I couldn't. So I went off to Mozambique as a as a major in the Mozambican army as a training officer. But again, you're right in the war zone. And um, but I was on the right side uh, with with the Frelimo government, and um, um, that was. Yeah. Ren Renamo and Frelimo, wasn't it? Yeah, well, we were fighting Renamo, um, left over from South African incursions against the AFC. Um, so that was a that was a complicated war with no uh, no heavy artillery and no air support. Um, but it was the only country I ever went home from where I was tearful because of the people. You know, they were such wonderful, wonderful people. So um, glad to go home. Sad to leave them. Yeah, I work, worked in a place called Nakala, Nakala Porter. Yeah, I know Nakala, yeah. Yeah, and uh, oh, fall in love with the people there. They, they fall in love with, with you as Nakunya. Yeah. Um, 
it was a very special experience, but gosh, if you go on safari, folks, in Mozambique, i give you a little warning. All the rebels have shot all the animals <laughs> and eaten well, them. they had. They had at that time. I mean, this is, when was this, 1989, 1990, I think. Um, yeah, about that time. And the Russians had just pulled out. So we were working with Russian equipment, which in some ways is quite good. It works. Um, they sent some SA-80s down for us to trial, and we threw them back in the grease and put them away and got AK-47s out again. Um, one of my most frightening experiences there was being fired upon by our own Katusha rockets, which are massive and um, cause an awful lot of damage. And um, we went out to see, me and a guy called Steve Devine went out the next day to see if we had been fired on by our own rockets because Renamo never had Katushas and um, discovered that we had. But then the colonel got frightened that we were going to report him to the general. And we thought that there was a serious chance that we were going to disappear into darkest Africa one night and our bodies would never be found again. So um, we, re we actually cocked our weapons and refused to go and visit the colonel. And then he sent a note back for us to sign saying that we hadn't seen anything untoward and that we hadn't been fired on by our own rockets. So we signed it. <laughs> Did the wise thing and signed it. Yeah. Robin, remind me the Russian connection there. Did that go back to the colonial war or was that part? No, no. The, um, the Russians um, supported Mozambique and the African National Congress against South Africa, against the apartheid regime in South Africa. And they supported people like Mugabe and Trilimo was the, um, the force, the armed forces of Mozambique that fought South Africa. Yeah. Um, that war was over with South Africa and Trilimo became the government. And when Trilimo became the government, the Russians, for reasons I don't understand, uh, pulled out, probably economic ones, um, and they pulled out and left there a lot of their equipment there. And then... The Frelimo government had problems with Renamo because Renamo had been trained by South Africa. They were Portuguese mulattoes who had no land. So they became marauding bandits in the country, attacking the railway lines that were trying to be built, the infrastructure, raiding the villages and killing lots of people. And um, Frelimo lacked um, good officers at the, at the junior level, you know, left them to major. So, they, uh, they asked us to go down and be their officers because their, their soldiers are incredibly brave if their officers are brave. If the officer runs, the soldiers run. Um, and they were there. I, just, I, did, uh, I have very, very fond memories of all of the people down there. Wonderful place, wonderful people. Sharing. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Mother Africa, it's... Uh, I haven't got words to words to just describe the experience and how fortunate I feel to have to have um, spent time there yeah I, I was on a this is my funny little dip I was on a train from uh, Moscow to St Petersburg and it was a it was a sleeper so I got in the carriage and there was a a Russian chap there and he looked at me and said you and he in Russian said do you speak Russian and I was no I said English? He said, no, no. He looked at me and said something like, Francais? Petit. And he said, Portuguese? Sing. Yeah, <laughs> and, a Portuguese. <laughs> sing. And it turns out he'd been in a military advisor in, in uh, he'd been a military advisor in the conflict. Yeah, I mean, war's war, bullets hurt, you know, uh, wherever you are. And uh, no one is worse than any other, really. Um, it's the people that suffer. Politicians start wars, soldiers fight them, and civilians die in them. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that's the great sadness of it all. So we rely on our politicians to keep us out of wars. Um, people who imagine themselves being heroes and soldiers always imagine themselves being the one that lives <laughs> they never imagine themselves being the one that gets a leg blown off or uh, or dies they never imagine that um they should 
you want to be a soldier, accept the fact that there's a fair chance that one day someone will say, you have to risk dying today. That's it, live by the gun. Mm. And it's also the landmine problem, isn't it? That the, the, the amount of these things that get left behind after these conflicts and ru ruins the land for the next, well, God knows how long, 50 yeah. years. Still kills children playing all over the world where mines are. Want to make nuclear arms illegal? Make mines illegal as well. If you don't manufacture the stuff, nobody can kill anybody with it. Yeah, that was the interesting thing about Diana, wasn't it? She, mm. she started talking out about the landmines and I do remember thinking she's going to upset the wrong people. She's going to upset the wrong people. And, and uh, yes, it does make you wonder. Yep. Robin, we were going to talk about the Northern Ireland veterans, weren't we? Yep. Yeah, uh, I've um, been involved in a campaign for the last four years uh, defending the uh, soldiers that are being persecuted and prosecuted um, by the Northern Ireland government um, in a search, as they claim it, for truth and reconciliation. Um, so they've got legacy groups that are funded by the British government hundreds of millions of pounds supposedly for truth and reconciliation that is being misused to prosecute soldiers who carried out actions up to 50 years ago who were cleared and exonerated that's the important part of the campaign we're fighting the soldiers that we're defending were cleared by the legal authorities at the time when the information was fresh when it was new, um, without any bias, they were cleared. And then to drag these things up 40, 50 years later and claim that there is new and compelling information, which there is not, and drag people repeatedly back to court um, in the hope that it's going to achieve a political objective or make large sums of money for law companies is immoral and wrong. And we've been working really, really hard for four years, we've had marches on the street. The newspapers and the government have tried to ignore us. Um, but we've got bigger. We've got some momentum, which sadly the COVID crisis has uh, diminished. But we're going to go back. I mean, I was in a Northern Ireland Affairs Committee meeting online in Parliament two weeks ago and put our case across with two other very good gentlemen, Paul Young and Harry Ragg. And... Um, they were surprised to find enlisted men like us being so eloquent and powerful and politically informed because you've got people there whose motivation isn't protecting people, it's political. Um, Sinn Féin want to rewrite history and claim that British soldiers were occupying Northern Ireland and carried out atrocities. Um, the Unionists want British soldiers to go to court to be found not guilty so they can be proven not guilty. Um, You've got, um, you've got the British government that wants to absolve itself from responsibility for it. You've got law companies that want to make millions, keeping the thing going over and over and over again. And all you're doing is putting one injustice upon old injustices. So there's never any settlement. So we don't want to uh, involve ourselves with Northern Irish, Northern Irish politics. We want the Northern Irish people to be successful in their peace process. But we want soldiers that have been politically attacked, um, given, um, put their, we want somebody highly powered in the legal, in the legal, in the legal process, and, and a retired judge to say that these prosecutions are vexatious, there's no new information, and we want these prosecutions to be stopped. There's no such thing as double jeopardy in British law anymore. Mm. So they can keep going back, trying over and over and over again on a different charge, a different piece of information. And we've got guys in their 70s who are dying of kidney disease, Dennis Hutchings being one example, but there are others, um, who are living out the last years of their lives, being treated as criminals by legacy policing coming over from Northern Ireland and arresting them on some flimsy information and then trying to interrogate them illegally back in Northern Ireland. It's wrong, it shouldn't happen. So I wanna get the process going. I'm trying to build up a uh, administration fund 
so that the guys can get around in England, get the people motivated against, because we're up against people with a pretty much an unlimited budget. And, um, you know, I'll put the links up at the end with you, I hope, and we can, um, we can direct people towards that if they want to support us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for clearing that up. It, it, it's this, again, it comes back to what we're saying about cowards. And it's, the, it's this political angle that there's always a wider picture that, that obviously is hidden from the public. And there's agendas and there's, there's this and there's appeasing the, the peace process, which is interest without going down that road. That's interesting enough in itself. For those of us that were there, God, you would just say categorically, absolutely no way the IRA would ever give up their cause, their fight. What, what I know that they haven't, they're going about it, the, you know, for a political mechanism, but it's what I'm trying to say is this ain't over. You know? They will go back, they will go back to the bomb and the bullet when the political process isn't working for them. They will go back to that. And they do regularly. There are riots, there are explosions occasionally in Northern Ireland. They don't get onto the world stage anymore. But with people today who don't remember and aren't old enough to remember Northern Ireland uh, should know certain simple facts. That the IRA never released any prisoners. If a British soldier was captured by the IRA, he was brutally tortured and murdered. Um, no, there were no survivors who were caught by them. They blew up people in Glasgow, in Birmingham, in Warrington, in London, all over the United Kingdom. It didn't just happen in the UK. They murdered thousands and thousands of people, including a large number from their, their own Catholic community. They're an organized criminal gangster organization, and they still are. And they still control Sinn Féin because Sinn Féin has to answer to the IRA Army Council. And they still control the drugs, the bookies and the vice in Northern Ireland and in some parts of area as well. Um, the greatest defeat that can actually, the greatest thing that can defeat them is an increasing uh, prosperity in Northern Ireland, peace to carry on, violence to diminish until they lose the support of the people because the people will have too much to lose by returning to that. Mm. So there's a, a very good reason for wanting to hold on to the peace process and negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. We just don't want our soldiers to be stuck in the middle of this again as sacrificial lambs for both sides to blame. We went there to protect all the population. And in the beginning, we went there primarily to defend the Catholic population. And nobody knows it anymore. Even many people in Northern Ireland don't know their own history. I've finished beating that drum. <laughs> yeah, no, you you put it very well. When we when we were there, Martin McGuinness was the area commander for the IRA in, in Bel yeah. Bel Bel uh, North Belfast, I think it was. And, Derry. Uh, was, was he Derry? London Derry, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, but it was also kind of well known. He was bringing, all, bringing in all the drugs as well. Yeah, well, they funded themselves with bank robberies, with drugs, from money from... Uh, money and arms and ammunition smuggled in from Muammar, Muammar Gaddafi from Libya, uh, who was funding most of the uh, terrorist organizations around the world. Um, their cause, if you go back to the 60s, um, the cause of the Republican movement in Northern Ireland was a just cause. It was civil rights. Um, bad politics led people into the hands of the Provisional IRA, which was formed after internment and after Operation Motorman in 1973, which turned the Catholic population against the soldiers. And from that point onwards, the IRA grew and the conflict became between the British Army and the IRA rather than between the UDA and the IRA. Um, bad politics took our soldiers there and good politics should finally take us out and leave us out. Robin, I just want to say this, and I don't mean any disrespect to anybody this it, this is just something that's kind of been on my mind since this whole um veterans northern iron veteran things cropped up but i mean when i was over there 
I saw some servicemen, in, including myself, do some things that we shouldn't have probably done in in hindsight as a as an old man now. You know, um, I fortunately never pulled the trigger when I shouldn't have done. I never pulled the trigger. I only had about three chances, and as you well know, the chances you're going to see the IRA gunman that's firing at you is it's like about mostly about that big yeah but there were i don't want to say trigger happy it's not the right phrase but you're young you're full of testosterone you're geared up with your your, your troop you 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 hate this enemy because you know you that that's your nat that's been the narrative and occasionally things went wrong and when yeah. the, and the adrenaline started flowing people would start yeah you know, people would I know where you're coming from pulling the triggers what what if it was your kid and i'm putting this out there you know theoretically for any of us that a soldier just went oh i'll sh i'll shoot i'll shoot that one right yeah. Now, if that was my boy or girl, I'd hunt you down for the rest of your life, right? And I'd either kill you myself or I would demand justice. Yeah, there are, but, there are things what, what people forget because of the continuous propaganda put out by the Republican movement is that every British soldier who ever fired a shot was investigated. Investigated initially by the military police. SIB, and then investigated by the Royal Ulster Constabulary. And um, there were no favours. There were no favours done. Um, so every time a British soldier, uh, even by beating somebody up or, you know, um, abusing somebody who was in, uh, in custody, um, they were arrested and investigated. Four British soldiers went to prison for murder during 30 years. And the, Sinn Féin would say, well, the only four. But we would say it's only four because of the high standard of training and professionalism and management that was held over them and the fact that they were under strict guidance. Other British, British soldiers went to prison, some for manslaughter, some for grievous bodily harm, some for assault. So they were all, and, some, and often they went to military prisons because they didn't want to be in the same prisons as obviously uh, IRA members in Northern Ireland. Um, so there was a, a very strong discipline and system of justice that developed over the 30 years to the point where it was very, very difficult for a British soldier to break the rules uh, as time passed by. And they were investigated and they were punished. Ah, if somebody came along today and had new and compelling evidence that had never been previously investigated, that showed that somebody had committed a, a terrible crime against somebody, fine, you know, put it through the courts, uh, get the guy up there to answer for it and um, let's see if he's guilty or not. But that's not the case we're fighting for. Yeah. We're fighting for the people that have been previously investigated, in some cases, several times, and exonerated several times, and now they want to drag them back to the courts again. And that's immoral, and that's wrong. And they say it's the law. But when the law's being used for immoral purposes, the law needs to be changed, as it was for the Good Friday Agreement. Thanks for clearing that up, Robin. <laughs> on a on a uh, more productive note, shall we say, what 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 does the future hold for you? Well, um, I, I mentioned that uh, I recovered from cancer recently, um, so I was um, getting involved more in politics, um, but I had to step back from that for a while because you know it takes a long time to recover, and um, I'm get, I'm doing quite well at the moment. So I want to come back to the UK. I want to uh, win this fight against the British government because the fight isn't against Sinn Féin, it's against the British government uh, for the Northern Ireland veterans. That's a big part of the reason I'm coming home, apart from missing my family. I want to continue to write. Um, I enjoy writing. I try to write something good or bad up on social media every day, the words of the wise old paratrooper. Um, which is a tag that I'm now quite proud of. And um, I want to write that novel one day. Um, and um, 
you know, I've got I've got other exciting other exciting things. Being stuck in limbo is the worst thing with this COVID thing. You know, it's hard. It's hard to keep the the fires burning. But uh, you know, the, I will. I, I've got my drums. I'm going to keep beating them really, really hard and get people back out there because when we fight a government, you don't fight them by saying they did, we did, we should. You know, you fight them with votes. And I want the veterans groups, all the veterans groups to come together as a voting block and say, we will not vote for your members of parliament unless you deal with this problem. And we will lobby them and we will pressure them with our votes, with the thousands, ten, hundreds of thousands of former servicemen who still live in the United Kingdom, who sympathize with what's going on. And we're going to pressure them with that voting block over and over again. That's where I want to go. Brilliant. Robin, stay on the line while I, I'm just going to say our official good, goodbye. And I've got a couple of ideas for us um, that don't involve anything like storming embassies, I'm afraid. So. <laughs> yeah, you carry on, mate. You carry on. <laughs> um, but Robin, massive thank you. On behalf of the Bought the T-Shirt podcast and all our friends at home, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Um, I'm absolutely honoured, mate, to be honest. Um, I remember seeing those black clad men pop up on my, on my uh, what was it, the BBC News back in the day. And, and uh, so, so thank you, sir. To our friends at home, massive love and respect to you. Thanks for watching another episode. If you like, please like. If not, who cares? I was, was going to say the world will keep turning, but apparently... I'm not allowed to say that. <laughs> that, that. That's now the subject for debate. That's fine by me. Um, but see you next time. Hello, friend. I hope this finds you well. My name's Chris Thrall. I'm a former Royal Marines commando, and I fought my way back from chronic trauma and addiction to live, work, and travel in 80 countries across all seven continents, achieving all of my dreams and goals along the way. Now I pass my simple system on to other people, but I can only help you if you like and subscribe. So please do so because you get one life and if you live it right, one is enough.